talk to David Nickel. Thank you. So my name's um, uh, David Nickel. Um, I'm still on Twitter at the moment, but uh, if at the end of this talk uh, you can find me on Mastodon due to Elon's rather thin skin. Um, this talk, I'm calling it the cancer of lying because actually it's the first talk I've given um, since actually getting over cancer surgery in September. I had uh, major surgery of prostate cancer, but my prognosis is so much better than the Conservatives. Um, but I'm going to talk about this because the focus is really about lying and misinformation and why this really matters and why this directly links actually to Jenny's talk. Of course, lies have been around since the beginning of time. And this book, you may not have read it, 15th century, on witches, um, it went viral, okay? It went viral due to technology, uh, the printing press. Hundreds of thousands of women got uh, burnt at the stake over the next 200 years because of witches. And of course, it was complete rubbish. Um, but I want to tell you why I got so interested in lying and so interested in human rights was in this date, 5th of June, 1989. I appreciate many of you may not have been alive then, um, but this was a uh, big, 1989 was a big year for me. It was the year I qualified uh, from Birmingham uh, as a doctor. Uh, and it was a really big day, really big day because of this photograph. And I remember just being uh, appalled really um, because for months we'd seen the students protesting in, in uh, what was then called Peking. And then Tankman stood up and said, you know, this is wrong. And we never knew what happened to him. In, in, in Tiananmen Square. And I think it's directly relevant to actually events uh, this year, um, the death of Masa Amini in Iran and really an incredibly brave woman, again, students leading protests against um, the clerics there. I mean, incredible courage of these women speaking out. And ultimately that becomes a, a really a, almost a question of how many people are going to die before there's change, you know. Um, so anyway, on that day in 1989, um, I joined Amnesty and was a bit of a sleeper human rights activist. Uh, in fact, until this day, uh, September the 11th, um, I was with uh, my daughter. In fact, <laughs> shortly after this, I took my daughter into this uh, IMAX screen when it was showing a film about NASA. And not surprisingly, she said, Dad, out. <laughs> so uh, we left uh, the Millennium Point. But this was 9-11, and a few minutes after this, of course, um, uh, we all knew what happened in the Twin Towers. And I remember at the time, uh, I was fuming about this because, in fact, one of the best days of my life was a, a couple of years before I'd been at the Windows of the World restaurant. I'd just got a bit major grant. I'd met one of my neurological heroes, Dr. Oliver Sacks. Uh, and I was fuming that these terrorists had ruined that memory. But then within a short period of time, um, you know, I'm originally I'm from Northern Ireland, uh, grew up in the 1970s, saw the risks of detention without trial and the mistakes that happened in the war on terror. And uh, I think it's worth remembering how, as Lib Dems, I wasn't a Lib Dem member then, how eloquently Charles K Kennedy and others, you know, spoke out against the Iraq war. And this was one of the biggest lies, the so-called weapons of mass destruction uh, that Saddam Hussein did not have. And in fact, it took years, years for this to come out. And there's a th theme on this, because um, it took years to identify that this false evidence that Colin Powell listed was based on torture of a guy called Alibi, um, who said that Saddam is in weapons of mass destruction. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because this guy shared a cell with uh, the man in the middle there, Shakar Amr who I spent over 10 years campaigning for. Think of the time, okay? He spent 14 years in Guantanamo. Uh, I ran the London Marathon twice dressed like that and ran around the White House once um, until he eventually got released. With all of these campaigns, it took years, but actually we have not got time. Um, but in all the other campaigns I've been involved in, there was a core was actually an untruth, a lie whether that was uh, drugs being used for execution, the death penalty is humane, um, whether that was, and this is just around the corner, there was exhibitions of Chinese body parts where there's really strong evidence that there were bodies of executed prisoners, again, spent years campaigning on this it's due to Lupul and Human Tissue Act. And of course, Brexit. <laughs> um, and I think about this, this was um, on the Victoria Derbyshire show on Brexit Day, and I was pointing out about the economic impacts of Brexit, and of course, oh, no, 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 that's Project Fear, Project Fear. Um, 
And of course, yes, you remember Dan Hannan? Yeah, absolutely. No one's talking about threatening our place in the single market. Well, you know, I'm afraid it was another lie. And yet we have the Telegraph uh, talking, saying, no, this is a project fair, as was alluded to Andrew Neil in the Daily Mail today, saying that this is the week that Brexit died. The clock is ticking. There's more campaigns to come. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm mentioning under COVID, and the reason I'm mentioning this, because I think the whole sense of mistrust that was alluded to um, in the previous talk to some extent, but also with the managed pandemic, um, you won't know this woman, but um, I'll, I'll mention Dr. Simone Gold is a, an American uh, emergency department doctor and anti-vaxxer um, who has got over half a million followers on Twitter. This tweet is complete garbage, okay? Um, she was involved with the whole QAnon uh, hypothesis of the January 6th, the invasion of the Capitol, uh, got, uh, you know, found guilty of involved that. So it's interesting how all this kind of misinformation lies links up, basically. And just last week, her organization, US Frontline Doctors, has kind of fallen apart because she's been taking hundreds of thousands of pounds in expenses. I mean, it's just, you know, Trump all over, basically. And you think, well, what's this got to do with the UK? And that's just America. We do things differently here. Well, I'm afraid not. Uh, Andrew Wakefield, one of the most prominent anti-vaxxers, um, the whole MMR um, side of things, suggesting it was unsafe. and. Uh, uh, I'm going to skip through this reasons of time. Oh, I mentioned Daniel Hannan at the beginning saying how that COVID was all, you know, this is, this is, this is all doom-mongering and panic um, when we know at least 10 million people have died worldwide. We have UK snake oil salesmen. I'm not going to say anything here that's defamatory, but um, you may not have heard of him, but uh, Asim Malhotra has over a quarter of a million uh, followers on Twitter. Um, and, uh, you know, he, uh, he tweets about awards he's never received. Um, he gives interviews to GB News regularly, okay? Um, and in fact, this particular interview, uh, it's had, what, two and a half million views on Twitter. I complained to the GMC and I complained to Ofcom. Ofcom did absolutely nothing. The GMC said that it was health misinformation. So I just asked the GMC, well, why don't you contact Ofcom? No. I mean, what is the point in having a regulator? Um, and, you know, this kind of stuff goes viral uh, and it's very hard to challenge. Let's talk about the non-COVID cons, <laughs> the 40 new hospitals, okay? Okay, and there's a characteristic of this with the Conservatives is if you get caught out lying, just tell a bigger one, okay? So let's talk about 48 hospitals. And the reason this really cheeses me off is top of the list is my own hospital, Middle of Metropolitan Hospital, which actually was planned in 2005 when even the Conservatives went in power. But a liar never backtracks. This uh, was last month. This is Michael Gove saying, well, you know, ask what are the downsides of Brexit? Well, you know, we wouldn't have had the vaccine rollout. Well, actually, Fred, that's another lie. Um, it's got a British medical... So just keep going. So we have to keep catching on this. So that's why I set up the ca uh, hashtag cancer of lying because it actually is quite knackering keeping up with them all. Great quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Soviet novelist. We know they're lying. They know they're lying. They know that we know they're lying. We know that they know that we know they're lying. And still, still they continue to lie. And actually talking about hearing Jenny talk about the pandemic, you know, this was directly relevant to myself. At the beginning of the pandemic, I worked uh, in a stroke ward, 25 beds in Sandwell, and I became really worried about hospital-acquired COVID. Um, and, you know, in that six months that we had, we had more deaths from COVID on that one ward than the entire population of Taiwan, okay, in six months. Um, and I felt it was very important scientifically to talk about that. And yet the central comms from NHS England was as if we were at war, okay? Look, I know COVID was bad, okay? But it wasn't Putin, okay? Um, so, you know, if any journalist spoke to a uh, hospital, it would have to get directed through NHS England. I was desperate to get this data out. Uh, in fact, I had quite an intense argument with my chief executive <laughs> at the time. You're trying to stitch me up? <laughs> um, so, in fact, the only way we got it out is I leaked the data to Newsnight. I didn't give my name. I didn't give the hospital's name. You know, we got to talk about it. 
And I think this does relate because if people don't know what is happening in their local area, they get suspicious, and that feeds into the, uh, some of the conspiracy theories. Uh, and also just, I mean, fascinating. I never thought I'd talk about nature, but this was Fox News talking about the more you watch Fox News, the worse it is for your health. You're more likely to be sceptical about vaccines. You're more, so um, it's, this is an issue of actually how broadcasters broadcast, pass information. Uh, more salt in it, and well, you know, it, it relates to even our current prime minister, you know, Rishi Sunak, who, I mean, I don't know about any doctors in the room, but we used to nickname this as eat out to spread it about. Um, because, in fact, uh, you know, he introduced this when cases were going up, which wasn't a very clever idea. And, it, and even the chief medical officer and chief scientific officer mentioned this at the time. It relates to the language you use with immigration and asylum seekers. This is the terrorist attack that happened last month. Um, and, you know, the language that gets used, this was a headline in the Daily Express saying that Sula Braveman was eyeing up three more countries uh, to the Rwanda deal. And uh, the tweet I've got is from the foreign minister from Belize saying, actually, this is rubbish. OK, so the lies keep getting told. And it's really, really important. We as Liberal Democrats challenge this. Is there hope? Yes, there is. This was last month, Alex Jones uh, being sued uh, successfully by... Uh, threading the false allegation about Sandy Hook. It relates to the midterm elections. I think that brings hope in terms of um, things, you know. But this is why the clock is ticking. The, and we haven't got years to campaign on this. So the one campaign I'm thinking about is actually the climate crisis and how we deal with it. I can't believe I'm going to show you a video of Mrs. Thatcher, also in the same year as when I qualified, 1989. While the conventional political dangers the threat of global annihilation, the fact of regional war, appear to be receding. We have all recently become aware of another insidious danger. It is as menacing in its way as those more accustomed perils with which international diplomacy has concerned itself for centuries. It is the prospect of irretrievable damage to the atmosphere, to the oceans, to Earth itself. Of course, major changes in the Earth's climate and environment have taken place in earlier centuries when the world's population... I mean, just think about that. Could you picture a conservative project? I mean, it just wouldn't happen, okay? And the answer to this is one word, Finland, okay? I'm not joking about the Monty Python song. I'm, I'm talking about the country, okay? Finland. Why am I saying that? Because I think there is hope, but we need to think about, like Jenny was saying, education, education, education. Finland has the highest rating for media literacy in the world, okay? And they teach this stuff, they teach this stuff about conspiracy theories uh, from kindergarten, okay? They teach, and you think, how do you teach a child of six media literacy? Well, they teach how statistics can be manipulated. They encourage discussion on misinformation using some of the kind of articles I've just been talking about. They discuss in art classes how images can be digitally altered. In history, they talk about the lessons of history in terms of propaganda. In science, they teach about vaccine misinformation. And this quote from a Finnish teacher I thought was great. Fairy tales work well. Take the wily fox. He always cheats the other animals with his sly words. That's not a bad metaphor for a certain kind of politician, is it? So I want to thank you. I want to thank you about the, the council line, but actually the links directly to what we were just saying about education, education. But the clock is ticking. And with the climate crisis, we can't afford the time that we've had with other campaigns. Thank you.